So thanks everybody for coming today. It's uh, great to see a group of people here for this event. My name is um, Kelly Johnson, and I'm the Father Furry Chair of Social Justice and a member of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton. Um, I'm really glad that we have some folks here together to participate in the first of what is going to be a series of events on active nonviolence as a collaboration with the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative at Georgetown. So this event came out of a conversation I was part of last year among some faculty at UD who started asking, what future are we actually preparing students for? And what do we need to be teaching them to equip them for these kind of new realities? Now, at the moment, we were really thinking principally about climate change, but also about the kind of um, profound mistrust that's become so characteristic of our social order and the growing power of extremism, the long continuation of gun violence in the US, the need for change um, in the country's approach to racial justice, and many other issues. And as I reflected on that question, um, right at the top of my list of things that we need to be teaching students, and also, by the way, faculty and staff, um, is active nonviolence. That is, we need to be learning ways to work unapologetically and effectively for justice in collaboration with other people in a way that is also working to heal and to create a social order that's based not on domination, but on participation. So I think of active nonviolence not just as a matter of certain kinds of techniques, but as a way of understanding social change and discovering um, how we can be, how we are, the people who can bring that about. So I'm really um, delighted to be able to introduce to you um, three speakers who are here with us today in alphabetical order. Um, Dr. Eli McCarthy is a co-founder of the DC Peace Team, which offers training in nonviolent communication, restorative justice, and bystander intervention, as well as in unarmed civilian protection deployments. He teaches at Georgetown in Justice and Peace Studies, his most recent book is an edited volume entitled A Just Peace Ethic Primer, Building Sustainable Peace and Breaking Cycles of Violence. He was formed by multiple trips to Haiti, working with the poor, working with people experiencing homelessness in Boston and DC, and monitoring the Palestinian elections in um, 2006 with Nonviolent Peace Force. We also have with us today Dave Ragland, who is the co-founder and former co-director of the Truth Telling Project of Ferguson. His activism and research focus on moral injury and the possibility of transforming violence and intergenerational trauma against vulnerable populations in the US. Envisioning and working for a world with reduced violence on all levels and the intersections of critical race issues, decoloniality, restorative justice, peace education with African and existentialist philosophies. As an activist, an educator, and a scholar, David's work has been rooted in his home community near Ferguson, Missouri. His analysis is drawn from the radical teachings of Martin Luther King Jr., especially his description of the triplet evils of racism, militarism, and materialism as an ever-present part of American life. Dr. Raglan focuses specifically on how our society conceives justice as retributive and proposes a shift toward a restorative justice that transforms communities and criminal justice systems. And third, we have with us Tabitha Thompson, who is a program officer with the Program on Nonviolent Action at the United States Institute for Peace, where she works on applied training, applied research training and education to better understand and support nonviolent movements that are working to transform violent conflict and to advance just peace. She leads the program Synergizing Nonviolent Action and Peace Building, that's SNAP, training efforts. Prior to joining USIP, Tabitha led DC's largest all-volunteer anti-human trafficking nonprofit, DC Stop Modern Slavery. Her field research and her training experience including, include work with local activists and peace builders in East Africa, Latin America, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Tunisia, as well as consultant work with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations in New York and Liberia. Tabitha has a master's degree with a focus on human rights, humanitarian policy, and conflict resolution from Columbia, Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and a bachelor's degree in international affairs and modern languages from the Georgia Institute of Technology. So I'm gonna um, hand the program over now to Dr. McCarthy. Thank you, Kelly. 
Thank you so much, Kelly, for the wonderful introduction. It's great to be with you all. I hope you're uh, each doing well and excited about the, the new fall adventure that we're about to embark on. Um, I'm going to begin by inviting Dave I, to, to share a little bit. I have a couple questions for Dave. Uh, the first question that I'd like to offer is, how do you describe active nonviolence? Uh, so I thought about this, but I'm still thinking about it. Um, I just, I describe, I mean, I, you know, sometimes I actually dislike the, the term nonviolence because of the, you know, um, it just begins with a negative. Um, but, but I, I see nonviolence as creative, uh, creating possibilities for, um, peaceful action and justice. Um, and I see um, um, you know, I think our society has spent so much time perfecting and coming up with new ways uh, to be creatively violent um, that we haven't put the energy into uh, nonviolent means. And, and I see um, active nonviolence is like sorely in this arena of uh, moving beyond what what people think as um, and I think this kind of like goes into like the the peaceful protester kind of thing like um, um, or, or passive or um, unwilling to challenge authority but I see active nonviolence as challenging authority, uh, challenging unjust laws, uh, challenging um, unjust systems uh, in ways that are creative, in ways that um, reinforce the humanity of the, the people who you are challenging as well. I, I see it um, as, you know, personally, I see it as a strategy um, and sometimes I see it as um, one of the options that violent societies prefer when facing um, other, uh, like, you know, in South Africa, um, they preferred the route of Nelson Mandela um, because there were also people using violent means. Um, and I think sometimes societies will not um, entertain, entertain the peaceful option without um, the violent alternative out there. Um, so that's my particular perspective. You know, I don't believe in using violence because I think that it's too easy to dehumanize and uh, yourself and others. But I think that that's the category of society or, or the space we fell into. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave, for getting us started. It's certainly uh, can be a tricky term, and, and some groups will have this phrase or this word active in front of it, um, try to orient it a little way. But some interesting insights, right, about creativity and challenging systems, uh, but also reinforcing the humanity of the adversary. Um, the thought that, you know, violence is functions in a way that's too easy to de dehumanize, right? That's a really interesting, I think, and important, um, important thought. So let's dive a little bit more into like how this looks and some of the work that you've, you've been doing in this space. So, you know, how do you, how have you engaged with active nonviolence for racial justice? Um, you know, we know some of your big projects around the truth telling project and some of the alternative community security work that you've done. So could you share a little more detail about some of that? Sure. Um, you know, in, in, in Ferguson, I think that was really important for me to understand, um, you know, people using, um, um, I would say like an in your face kind of protest, right? That was, that was different in, in previous generations. And initially, I was really um, 
taken aback by it because you know my my um experience had been um the the traditional kind of like the sixties approach um you know that we've all been taught in the civil rights movement um and i and I believed in it as a as a way um to claim power and i and I think that the problem with that is that they it the the history books and the stories that we hear give us one narrative and the narrative they they don't talk about is like how um things like like the war in vietnam really ended uh because um our government could not um um execute the war there were so many soldiers who were disobeying who were actually sabotaging um, and and doing things that that sort of they did not believe in in the the violent um, uh, use and approach. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, oh, see you later, baby. Um. So so I think you know part of part of our approach in um in Ferguson was like learning from history um and also acknowledging that is that is is really important like the important role of like the organic movement and what that teaches us um and then like what we tried to do in the true time project was create hearings that we kind of like rooted and based on what we learned from South Africa and from Greensboro um, to dramatize just another way of dramatizing like what was happening and to help uh, people who were sharing their stories on the protest lines um, to share them in um, in a different format in a in a place that we made sacred that the community made sacred and that uh, giving families who had experienced police violence the chance to share those stories. Um, and as, as Eli kind of pointed out, um, some of our organizers face threats, um, you know, just from, from their own, their participation in the protest and their, um, you know, political activities. And so, um, as a as a ideology and a set of values, we were really committed to active nonviolence and committed to um, you know some creative ways to protect ourselves. Um, um, and so we've we've been engaged. And well, well, first we've been in conversation with um, uh, the DC Peace team, and then we um, work. Uh, hand in hand with them right now, um, protecting some of our organizers who have received threats um, and been threatened. Um, and, you know, just our polarized political environment has um, really brought out um, like some of the worst elements in, in our society. And so um, at the same time, you know, I think we're we're not interested in in you know going down to that level. So um, it's been really supportive of this approach. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so this true telling project was kind of based on a little bit out of what was happening in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? So you had these hearings, and people came and shared their stories and um what happened after they shared their stories like what what was sort of the next steps with that so um we we created and so let me let me just go back a little bit um we spent a lot of time uh learning from greensboro truth commission and there were folks um who worked on our um on our project um, from South Africa, who had worked on the Truth Commission in South Africa. And we, we, were, we were really interested in truth and reconciliation, but our, our community 
um, had questions about the reconciliation part, especially given the place that um, South Africa was at. Like they were, I think we're closer to this place now, but um, they were at a part, a place in their society where it was, it was one, or, one of two directions, civil war, or figure out a way to come together. And um, I think we have to see truth and reconciliation as uh, among other things, as a way that the state itself um, tries to um, continue its existence um, and try to try to deal with the the factions that um, that want to um, want it to devolve into something else, or maybe not even devolve or evolve. Um, and so, but also. Um, I really think that truth and reconciliation requires that um, both both parties, or or at least like the the party that's committed the harm, sees what they've done as wrong. And um, for us, we didn't see that. Not only do we not see in Ferguson that um, that people thought that what Darren Wilson how he murdered Mike Brown in cold blood was wrong, um, that, that our system of justice did not even consider it to be um, murder and wouldn't try it as murder and still won't try it as murder. Um, and that's similar to many murders of African-Americans in this country. And so um, in addition, you know, um, every time uh, African Americans are murdered. Black folks, um, can, and and now many white folks in this country are, and people of color are traumatized. Um, and so we really thought it was important that we uh, focus on truth telling um, as a way that the community is heard and that we reset and be in charge of our own narrative. Um, and that's urgently important when you know, uh, the media um, irresponsibly um, puts forward a narrative like rooted in uh, what uh, police authorities, you know, have offered up. And so uh, we went forward, um, you know, having been, having had the Department of Justice reach out to us about doing something, having had the National Guard uh, uh, of Missouri and a number of officials wanting to be a part of a process. And the community didn't want that because they didn't trust them. Um, and so, you know, we, we put something together where people could tell their story. Um, and, and, and we only chose uh, certain stories because we didn't want to get into the business of like a truth seeking process, which is like an intensive, um, a uh, process that requires like lots of funding and, and um, but we wanted to uh, put, uh, put stories out there or have people share stories that have been uh, to a large extent vetted um, in the press and vetted among communities. Um, and, and so um, we put, we had a number of stories like um, Tamir Rice's family came to Ferguson and share their stories. And we also wanted people to share uh, stories that humanized uh, people because um, the official narrative went to a great deal to make it so people who were murdered were criminal or create um, a narrative that, that those people were criminal and that um, our police were not criminal when they are. Um, and so um, we also wanted stories to reach uh, people around the country. And so um, we, we worked with, it, with some of our hearings with StoryCorps. Um, and so some of our stories are um, with StoryCorps and in the Library of Congress. And then um, we also worked with um, we created a multimedia site called it'stimetolisten.com 
uh, with lesson plans that we're in the process of overhauling now. So you can go to the website, um, but we are working on that and updating it. Um, and it's time to listen uh, was a way um, so that people can learn and that we can connect with teachers. Uh, we're in the process of um, planning a, a national teacher convening on, on how to tell the truth about difficult issues like police violence. Um, so yeah. that, that's kind of uh, our approach. That's really helpful to kind of like paint the picture for us. I'm sure people have some other questions. So if you could kind of, you know, jot your questions down or hold them for a moment, I'm going to shift to Tabitha and let her share a bit. And then I'll wrap up with some, um, some thoughts about the DCP team and then we'll open it up for the large group to have some more discussion. So thank you, David, for getting, getting us started. And we love to, we have time to hear more about your work on alternative community security, particularly in um, one of the smaller towns in Missouri that you worked with in the past. But Tabitha, could you share with us um, how you would describe active nonviolence or, or nonviolent action, perhaps? Yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, we, uh, based on active nonviolence and nonviolent action, we would use those terms interchangeably. And, and oftentimes we will use active nonviolence in places where nonviolent action is seen as, you know, I think, David, you alluded to as, as something that, that can be negative um, in, in some societies. And I think that, you know, your, your definition really hit the, the nail on the head in terms of um, it, it's a nonviolent way for ordinary people to engage in, in ways to change, you know, build, build power to be able to change something about their community that they're unhappy with. And we often define that as, as positive uh, change, uh, you know, whether it's political, social, or economic, but there are definitely groups that try to use nonviolent action to um, try to achieve negative change. And we can talk about why uh, those, those tactics might be unsuccessful for, for them. So um, I, would, I would definitely echo and reinforce what, what David mentioned there. I think one of the distinctions that we make when we're working with activists and, and peace builders in different places in the world is we generally distinguish not to create like an artificial silo, but we try to make sure that, that people are understanding what we mean, you know, when we say nonviolent action from the moral and, and principled stance and, and how that might motivate people to engage in this way of, of we call waging, waging conflict, but nonviolently versus um, looking at it as a strategic uh, method and a strategic approach. Um, and I think we tend to emphasize more, not you know, that we place value on, on either one, but we tend to emphasize more of the strategic approach um, because uh, we're engaging in places where violent conflict is happening already. Um, and, and we try to give the, the activists you know, that, that we're working with multiple ways to try to make a case for why nonviolent action might be a more effective way to, um, to, to achieve their, their goals than engaging in, in violent action. And that's based in, in research that, that our team's director did with a co-author, Erica Chenna, with my, my director, her name is Maria Stefan, and she wrote a book called Why Civil Resistance Works. Um, which looked at over 300 nonviolent and violent campaigns in what we call maximalist environments. So these are campaigns that were working to uh, change government or working for self-determination. Um, and they, they chose those types of campaigns because they thought those were going to be the most difficult campaigns to, um, to really succeed in. And, and oftentimes those were the ones that would um, you know, most resort to, to, to violence. And they found that um, the nonviolent campaigns were actually twice as effective as the violent campaigns in achieving their goals. Um, so I can um, definitely share some of the graphics and, and stuff that are associated with that research. There was a lot of other interesting um, findings that, that came along with that. But that when we when we talk about nonviolent action, it really really do emphasize that that strategic choice. And so I'm um, just going to share a couple of pictures. I think um, especially and and today. Uh, People like the news headlines and stuff are always talking about, oh, there's a rise in, in global protest. We're in the age of protest. And so when people think about nonviolent action, they think about marching in the streets and, and protesting, um, which are, you know, the, I tried to collect a lot of pictures from uh, different contexts and most recent examples of, of this protesting happening, whether it's in Iran uh, or what's going on in Hong Kong. We see the 
um, the Orange Revolution in, in Eastern Europe, and this uh, the bottom left corner is uh, a movement in Burkina Faso called Ballet Citoyen, which means citizen's broom. Um, but uh, in reality, there are a lot of other tactics um, and actions that you can take as part of, of nonviolent action. Um, you know, what, what David was describing, actually, you know, arts are such a big part of nonviolent action and, and peace building. And so just from what you were describing with, with the truth telling project, like that is a form of, of raising this issue and, and trying to, to get people to better understand and empathize and, and you know, recruit people to, to this cause and, and to, you know, seeing that this injustice is an important thing that needs to be, it needs to be addressed. And so other ways that, that you might engage in nonviolent action, and um, we can share a, a list of um, different types of, of nonviolent action, though that list uh, definitely needs to be updated and extended. But Jean Sharp is um, a huge scholar in the nonviolent action uh, realm and he came up with 198 different tactics you could use, but there are definitely more, especially in the digital age. So these are just a few different examples. You know, nonviolent action can take the form of training and, and thinking through strategic planning for how you might sequence different tactics as part of a bigger picture instead of just going out and joining, you know, uh, a protest, which might just happen uh, on, on a particular weekend. Um, it can be very symbolic. So in the bottom right hand corner, um, we see uh, Burmese monks um, who are uh, basically um, denying the taking of, of psalms from, from the government to, to protest violence that is happening against um, people who have been protesting against the government. Um, we see, I, I have some examples of uh, nonviolent action age of social distancing where you see um, protests and demonstrations that are, you know, keeping in line with wearing PPE and um, being socially distant, the, what this one was in South Sudan a few months ago where they were protesting the, the violent um, rape and uh, killing of a, a young woman in, in Juba. Um, and these are just uh, some other examples of, of what nonviolent action has looked like in the age of, of COVID where you see socially distant protests um, in the upper left hand corner. It's an example of a Casa Loraso, which is happening a lot throughout Latin and Central America. Um, to protest the way government is responding to the virus um, and increasing repression. Um, we also see, you know, mutual aid networks. A lot of the organizations and networks that we're working with around the world are um, using their existing infrastructure for organizing and uh, instead, you know, collecting food to provide communities and really filling a gap in, in government services that is really kind of creating this alternative, you know, constructive um, uh, institution and intervention um, and, and the society and, and future they want to see where we're taking care of one another versus what, what exists currently. So that's a, probably a longer than needed answer to your question, Eli. Thanks, Tabitha. Those are always really helpful um, to kind of see how this is proliferating, um, not just in the U.S., but in many other places around the world, and we can learn a lot from some of that work. So I was wondering if you could maybe tie this to, to racial justice a little bit more. You know, what are experience working with these activists? What are some examples or patterns of nonviolent action for racial justice? Uh, you might be seeing outside the U.S., but, you know, things that we can learn for using nonviolent action in the U.S. for, for racial justice. Yeah. Um, so I, I picked three and I tried to make them kind of geographically diverse of groups and, and activists that we've had the opportunity to work with through the years that um, are working on um, particularly like racial, uh, ethnic or, or tribal issues. And so um, the first one that you can see in the, the um, left side of the screen, uh, it, it's actually, you know, there, there's, this is a, a case from the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua where there are a lot of indigenous um, communities that are uh, really trying to, to push for um, basic human rights and, and land rights and um, the ability to, to cultivate and um, benefit from the land that has been in their, in their family for, for generations. Um, and then uh, the upper, and, and that's, you know, kind of synonymous with a lot of uh, indigenous movements right now in, in Central and in Latin America. Um, and then the upper right hand corner, this is uh, from a Hazara led movement in Afghanistan um, that was called the Dabasa movement and the Hazara community is an is a ethnic minority in Afghanistan that has been experiencing a lot of violence. And so this 
um, movement was specifically to try to hold the government accountable to some violence um, that had happened against uh, seven Hazara um, members. And in the bottom right hand corner, I think it is something that, that David and Eli have already mentioned, this is the anti-apartheid um, movement in South Africa and some general trends that, you know, we can make across a lot of these different case studies is um, these movements are, are largely start off as being led by these, you know, marginalized peoples and, and communities, um, but who have been doing this work for generations and generations. When it comes to sustained organizing, they have really like mastered, <laughs> mastered that. Um, they are much more concentrated in local issues and trying to achieve um, you know, gains within local governments or, you know, at the level of the municipality. Um, but when we've seen these movements become, um, you know, more successful in, in achieving some of their goals or making, getting some concessions from um, the, the governments and people in power, it's when they're able to, you know, recruit people from outside of their community um, to, to march with them, to um, engage in nonviolent action with them, um, and, and to teach them about their way of sustained organizing, um, as well as uh, being able to understand the full context in which they're operating and take advantage of different peaks in which they can tack on to other issues and, and help their local platform be, you know, more subsumed into a national platform, but in a way that doesn't, you know, allow for the loss of, of their issues being prioritized in any sort of national platform. Um, so those are some, some things that we notice of, of like when they have been more, more successful. And I think, you know, the, the big key thing that um, a lot of these movements uh, that make them successful and that allow them to do this is in strategic planning and how they engage and, and kind of um, bring up younger activists within their communities and do training around strategic planning and how to think about who their target audiences are to, to be able to mobilize and, and how do they reach them and um, where, do they, where do they reach them. And in thinking about, um, you know, the local and national level issues or when there might be an opportunity to sequence, you know, internal pressure they might be providing with external pr pressure from other governments or international organizations, um, the, that kind of investment in strategic planning allows them to do that. And so when we actually are doing trainings in different places, a lot of the people who have the knowledge already and, and to help us contextualize you know, our, our curriculum are people from these communities. So what this means for, for us is, is really, you know, and I think that this has been shared a lot already by you know, nonviolent action uh, scholars and, and practitioners in the US, but really relying on, on these long-term structures that already exist. You know, BLM is, um, I think, the, the latest iteration of the long-term civil rights movement. Um, and, and so, you know, really taking the lead from people who have been most um, marginalized and most affected by these injustices and looking at the existing infrastructure and figuring out how to, to plug in instead of forming something that's duplicative, moving beyond tactics to strategy. Um, so, you know, not just thinking about these different things that you may engage in and, in, um, you know, one off kind of approaches, but what this looks like in the long term. Um, and then just being able to, you know, connect the grassroots and the local with the national where it makes sense, but then also make sure that you're, you're you know, that it's a two way communication and that you're taking these national level issues as well and talking about what this means at the local level so that you're not losing um, what is driving people to the streets in the, in the first place um, as, they, as you're trying to push for something that's a little bit more national. Great. That's really helpful, Tabitha. Thanks for kind of identifying some clear and you know, big emphasis on like strategic planning, right? And it doesn't have to be this real depth, in-depth, scary thing. It's just about thinking, you know, wisely about what our goals are and what kind of actions and sequence will, will kind of get us there. Um, so let me um, share a little bit about the DC Peace Team and then we'll open it up to others input and questions around active nonviolence and and racial justice. So my kind of present perspective about active nonviolence has really grown out of a lot of recent encounters over the past few years, particularly with people living in violent conflict zones from around the world. We've had two global gatherings in Rome with people from um, Africa and Latin America and Asia. And we've also done regional gatherings in many of those spaces. And these are folks coming, 
coming from the war in Iraq and Syria, but also you know, the Philippines and Colombia, and South Sudan, and, um, Nigeria, and so forth. So let me share with you one quote from a sister named Nazik Maddy from Iraq. This was kind of a, a quote that she shared at one meeting in Rome. She says this, she says, war is the mother of ignorance, isolation, and poverty. I say this as a daughter of war. We can't respond to violence with worse violence. In order to kill five violent men, we have to create 10 violent men to kill them. This encourages the spiral of violence up and up. And the people are so exhausted because they don't know what's happening. It's like a dragon with seven heads. You cut one and two others come up. So we heard many stories like that. And I'm going to put in the chat box uh, a link to a Google Doc, which just has some has that quote in it. And some other things I'm going to reference here is kind of walk through a few pieces about active nonviolence. So growing out of these stories and these like deep, urgent uh, calls for a turning to deeper understanding, commitment to nonviolence, um, we can also draw on other leaders like Martin Luther King and Dorothy Day and Gandhi. And there's kind of four guideposts that I just want to highlight from their work, which I think is helpful for our reflection. One is that nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And this is about our daily practice, right? To what extent can we grow in nonviolence in our daily ordinary life to make it a habit or a virtue? You know, how we interact with our family and our friends, and our coworkers, how we treat ourselves, um, what we consume and what we eat, for example. A second key theme is that nonviolence seeks understanding and movement toward partnership. So we've got big scale examples like this with Gandhi in India, you know, with his nonviolent movement over many years and when the British left after occupying the country, they still had many characteristics of uh, partnership, if even a friendship with India. King talks about this as kind of choosing loving connection rather than hate or disconnection, because he sees nonviolence as a constructive force, not just not this sort of obstructive force, but something that's constructive. And his point under this is that we don't want to reinscribe the kind of us versus them mentality or way of acting, because we know in the long run, this becomes a seed for more violence. So third, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. So we try as best we can to separate the action from the person. You know, no matter what we do, we still maintain our dignity. And when we can act this way, this can actually throw the adversary off balance, because they often expect like hostility or humiliation or direct violence in return. So a good example, David Hartso, he was in the lunch counter sit-ins in the civil rights movement in the 60s in the US. And a man broke into the, the restaurant he was doing a sit-in at and he had a knife and he ran it up to Dave, David's heart. And he said, you got one minute to get out of here or I'm gonna run this knife through your heart. David was meditating a bit before this and he took a moment and he said, you do what you have to and I'm going to try and love you just the same. The man's hand started to shake with the knife and he started to walk back and he turned around and left the restaurant. David was able to separate the action from the person. The fourth point here is that nonviolence holds that voluntary suffering to resist injustice and violence can educate and transform. So we've seen this in the march in Selma, the sit-ins, a number of the BLM marches, that when we risk suffering through nonviolence, it helps to expose the injustice and the violence in a very clear way. 
And this opens up often opportunities for transformation. So it's not saying, of course, that suffering in itself is good or anyone who is being harmed should simply be passive and accept the suffering. It's particularly around nonviolence as a voluntary suffering to resist injustice. So you'll see on your participant doc that there's a, a little broader description, a working description of nonviolence that kind of draws from that, but also many of these stories that we've heard and you know, just to kind of name some elements about it, that it's a positive reverence. It's a positive reverence for dignity and life, as well as the constant effort to try to avoid dehumanization and participation in other types of violence. And then there's other elements underneath that, which Dave and Tabitha have mentioned in different ways as well, but also a spirituality, a way of life, um, and an intersectional approach to social issues, which we could talk more about. So let me just wrap up with, with a couple, uh, two or three more minutes about the DC Peace Team. Um, so we've been around since 2011. Our mission is really to try to cultivate these habits and skills in our ordinary life so we can become more nonviolent people and resist injustice. We've got three basic spheres of action. One is training. We do training in uh, nonviolent communication, which is like interpersonal conflict where you're trying to identify feelings and needs so you can get to the deeper roots um, and make specific requests. Um, we've also used nonviolent communication training around issues of power and racism. We have sessions on that. We have one coming up tomorrow actually on that topic. Um, we've done NBC with marginalization in the workplace um, with some folks here in the DC area. Bystander intervention is another training that we do. This is about if you're come upon a situation that you haven't expected and someone's harassing another person, um, how can you intervene, diffuse, enable the person who's being harassed to kind of unleash their own agency in the moment? And we have a number of kind of tactics that we, that we share for that. Um, restorative justice circles, you've heard a little bit about that uh, through Dave. And then unarmed civilian protection. So, Unarmed civilian protection is deploying unarmed civilian protection units to places of potential hostility. And our goals are normally to prevent violence, to interrupt dehumanization, and to cultivate empathy when possible. So some examples are like there's neighborhood situations where a uh, place called Gallery Place in DC where youth have sometimes gotten into some fights or police have har harassed the youth. So we go there to monitor and, and intervene at times. Um, we also have been um, working in St. Louis, accompanying uh, a black woman community organizer who's a candidate for office who requested some um, accompaniment. So we have a team there that we help to train and coordinate. And we also do political demonstrations. So protecting those most at risk and trying to support nonviolent resistance. But these are places where there's a, usually a counter protest. So like the Republican National Convention, 2016, uh, Unite the Right Rally in DC, March for Life, been to the Southern border in Tijuana and San Diego around immigration events as well. So those are some examples. There's a, a bi-national network called the Shanti Sena Network of peace teams in the US and Canada. If you wanna hear more about or become part of that, to let me know. And our work is really a lot based on human dignity, trying to illuminate the dignity and unity of all people. That we're one human family. And this invites us to communicate with the actors, um, all the actors in a particular conflict as best we can. So let me leave you with this um, one other resource. It was also noted in your participant doc but it's an alternative community protection brief or alternative community security brief. Um, it's got a lot of the agendas of BLM and the Poor People's Campaign and also some things that have been happening in policing here in the US and changes and then some potential directions we could go um, both towards the end of the document, but there's also this kind of like three phased approach, um, which is like the third point down from the top. So that's a little example of how we could possibly walk through um, really transforming our system of protection and 
you know, phase one would include the things that we've been hearing about investing in marginalized communities, reducing spending on police, um, but also broad community training and some of the skills I mentioned above, uh, increasing restorative justice in our systems. Phase two could be more about developing neighborhood peace teams along with violence interrupters that many communities do have right now. Um, we can do more there. Pilot some unarmed policing in two or three neighborhoods, for example. Um, phase three would be more about trying to move towards mostly unarmed police officers, restorative justice across all schools and criminal systems, justice systems, um, and reduction of guns in society as well. So these are things to imagine about. But let me open it up here and see what you would like to add uh, to this reflection on active nonviolence and racial justice. And if you have particular questions for Tabitha or Dave or myself, the floor is open. Um, thank you guys. I, sometimes it's hard to break the ice, so I'm going to go ahead and break the ice, but don't let this stop anybody else from jumping in. This is just the official icebreaker. Um, I was thinking as I, as I listened to you guys, um, I, think it was, I think it was Tabitha who was talking about um, nonviolent action as a way for um, ordinary people to build power for change. Right, so this is, you don't have to be a soldier. This is for, this is for people to find ways to, to get a grip on their situation. And, and that's a really compelling um, reason, I think, to be paying attention to um, nonviolent activism. By the way, I have to say, in case you didn't know this, um, Dr. Chenoweth has a special connection to UD because she was an undergrad. Her undergrad degree is actually from UD. But, um, then I wonder, so it's about ordinary people being able to get a grip on their situation and, and do something to change it. On the other hand, it, it feels pretty extraordinary, right, to take the steps to start doing these things. And I know some of the questions when people submitted questions ahead of time, some of the questions were about like, but how do you move from talking into action or how do you make outrage into something constructive or how do you deal with the fact that anything you do makes people so angry, especially for racial justice? Like, how, it seems like any kind of protest you engage or action, right, for non um, for racial justice gets such kind of hateful pushback. Um, so, so we had some questions ahead of time that I think are related to this. Like, can ordinary people really do this, and or how do ordinary people? become people who are able to do this kind of stuff. And I would love to hear any of you respond, but I'm especially thinking about Dave um, in relation to this, if you want to say anything about that. Um, I also want to say I have a connection with UD. Um, I went to undergrad um, at Wilberforce University, which oh, is wow. right down the road. And I used to hang out with some of my fraternity brothers on the UD campus years and years ago. Um, and I know your mayor too, uh, Nan Whaley, uh, very well. So, cool. um, but I would say that, um, you know, the, the reason why I appreciate nonviolence is uh, nonviolent um, action um, is because um, it does that. It, it, it is for ordinary people, it is ordinary people power. Um, it helps people realize the power that they have. Um, and, you know, I want to point out, like, for instance, people like Cori Bush, um, who, who just won her uh, Democratic primary in the Missouri Congressional District. Ordinary person who was uh, really persistent. Um, and I think, like, you know, what we're talking about is essentially a, a tool to help people every day express the conditions of their life um, and, and the experiences that they're having. And so I don't know if there's any special insight beyond um, that, you know, often um, 
is people who've experienced the brunt of our system, the violence in our system, who are really willing and most likely to put everything on the line and, um, you know, stick their neck out. Um, and then people, people, um, people are inspired by that bravery and come and stand with them. Um, and then, you know, um, I think about like so many, you know, I've been in, engaged in nonviolent action um, since, um, since I was in high school, you know, um, and I've uh, organized against the war um, in, uh, against Iraq and in Afghanistan. And, you know, though I've just come across um, everyday normal people, but um, speaking about racial justice, um, I think I also, so when we started the, this project in, in Ferguson, many, many people, cause I was a faculty member um, and I taught peace and conflict studies courses. And, you know, a lot of my colleagues, um, I think one of the big problems is that even our field um, has to a large extent historically been complicit in not articulating racial justice as a core part of what structural violence is and not articulating how the US government exports violence everywhere and how the US and Europe essentially created every map, every border and I'll have a large part in the creation of weapons that are used around the world in conflict. And so how do, how do, how do those same people make peace? Um, and so there, there are some questions that, that have to be dealt with. Um, and so that's, those are some of the pushback that I was dealing with when, you know, asking peace folks to be talking about like racial justice, violence, because there was a positionality of looking at the rest of the world as violent and not looking at the systems that we benefit from here as violent. Um, and, and in my peace and conflict studies course, one of the first day I used to have students, you know, I used to ask, so what is violence? Um, and then they would name everything outside of the US or in communities of color. And I would say, go to the window and look out. And, and we would talk about how our institutions are rooted in violence. So, you know, I really think it's a matter of telling the truth about um, the way that our, our institutions um, are, are grounded. You know, um, University of Dayton, like many other places is on stolen land. You know, how has the Catholic Church been complicit, right? The doctrine of discovery. And so what, I mean, until the institutions um, tell the truth and begin paying reparations, um, it's gonna be hard for, for our textbook manufacturers and other people to actually come forward and educate people about our real history. So you know, to a large extent, you know, we face so much violence because the people who should be telling the truth don't. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Any other comments on that? Or Tabitha, you want to jump in? Yeah, just, um, I mean, I think that it, it, is, it is really hard. And as the US is becoming, I don't think that it wasn't that we were polarized before, but it's becoming even more you know, uh, transparent how, how polarized we are as a society. It, it does take a lot of courage and, and bravery to, to speak out and engage. And so I would just say, you know, if you're looking for ways to engage, like look at what's already going on in, in your community and look at groups that are already organizing, oftentimes, they offer very low risk ways to even come and figure out what they're about um, and, and what they're doing. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 
engaging in nonviolent action doesn't have to look like going out to a protest or um, you know, doing something on your, your social media page, but it could look like donating to a mutual aid network, you know, donating food to, to, to people who are, are going out protesting, you know, setting up water stations, things like that. And, but just seeing what, what's out there already, it doesn't mean that you have to organize something on your own and that's your first, your first step. Um, and then the other thing I would just share is, you know, the, um, we talked a little bit about the, the synergizing nonviolent action and peace building or, or SNAP curriculum. Um, and the whole kind of um, backstory and then kind of premise of what we what we talk about when we have those workshops is that you know there there are different approaches to addressing problems. Sometimes that's nonviolent action and really trying to figure out how you build power and how you raise awareness and how you um, you know kind of uh, create conflict for the the sake of, of positive change. Um, and sometimes that might be more from the peace building realm. So like dialogue and negotiation and um, uh, and mediation, and, and you need both approaches to be able to get something, you know, done and, and, and to be able to push the, the meter forward. And so, like, um, my background is not as much in the activism side of things, but more so in the peace building and dialogue side of things. And so, you know, uh, some organizations I've been a part of have been facilitating dialogues um, on um, what it means to defund the police, for example. And we had a really helpful conversation with people from different parts of the US, both rural and urban, I'm um, talking about, you know, like the, it seemed like the, the problem that a lot of people had was with the word defund. And the definition that people had for the word defund was so big, like it was like on a spectrum of some people like completely abolishing the police to like police reform, common sense police reform, right? And um, just being able to have that conversation, one of the things that we were, we were pointing out was, you know, if we didn't have a word so, um, kind of, you know, not even progressive is not the right word, but like if we didn't have a word that was so like alarming for some people like defund, would we even be having this conversation in a meaningful way? Because we've been talking about police reform for so long and have we really had any meaningful police reform especially past a, you know, local level? And so it's, you know, just trying to figure out too, like where you're coming from and what your strengths are and how, how you would be able to engage with your strengths and not trying to, to force and be something that you're not but figuring out you know, where, how, how you can show up and how you can contribute and using existing structures to do that if you're feeling a little bit um, timid and, and this is your, your first time. Thank you, Tabitha. Any other input, comments from others in the group on this topic or questions? Yeah, I had one question. Um, so for Tabitha, you had a slideshow that had so many photos. I just had a question about one of the photos in the upper left corner. You said something about Latin America and how they're protesting like a person was turning on a light, something like that. I was just wondering what that was. Yeah, that one. Sorry, didn't realize I was on mute. Um, it's uh, Casal Rosso. It's um, it wasn't. They weren't turning on the light. She's banging against a pot um, or a pan, and so it, it's just a, a form of protest that's very popular um, in in Latin America. It's used in other places too. I'm, I'm almost positive they were using Spain and 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 Greece at the beginning of the the pandemic. Um, but it's just a, a form of everyone goes out at a coordinated time and bangs on on pots and pans. Um, and, and it's for a particular message and, and they were able to share beforehand, you know, the time and what people should do and what they were actually banging their, their thoughts for. Okay, thank you so much. Your question. Anybody else? Question or comment? Um, I have a question um, to anyone who would like to answer that. Um, so I'm wondering about the impact of social media for like nonviolent action, especially in regards to, um, I think um, David mentioned in regards to truth telling. Um, do you think that um, social media is like um, advantageous to promote truth telling or would you rather see um, hashtags like Black Lives Matter more as a, as a resource or like a, a, an organizing tool for promoting change can, can you can you ask it again i'm trying to understand the question yeah absolutely so i'm wondering about um the influence of hashtags in um social action for example 
And I know that, um, you know, the hashtags Black Lives Matter, like, um, became so impactful on, on social media that, um, you know, people use it as like, a resource um, to stay on top of things. What just happened? Um, they use it as an organizing tool to um, to gather. Um, but I'm wondering if there's also like a chance to pro um, to promote this idea of like truth telling towards like hashtags or social social media. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're yeah, sure. I think you can use hashtags to like um, to help people identify stories. You know, I saw this. You know, I saw this in the Me Too movement, and I saw it recently uh, when women were telling their stories about, um, actually in Puerto Rico, where uh, women were telling their stories about a uh, particular people, a particular person who had been accused of um, sexual assault and had denied it. And so many people, like, uh, actually, so many women used that this hashtag to like come forth and tell their story to stand alongside, you know, this woman who was uh, making a claim. And so um, I definitely think it, think it can be used as a way to, to, to get out uh, particular perspectives and tell stories. It just has to be one that's really identifiable um, and, and not confused with other ones. Sometimes you can like, you can get lost in social media and I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not like an expert. I just, you know, I, I probably raised the surface of like the way that, um, that people can use um, social media and particularly um, hashtags, but there's some other organizers who know this stuff better than me. Thanks for your question. Tabitha, anything you wanted to add on that? I think that um, it's interesting. We're, we're starting to do a little bit more research on social media and especially on um, digital authoritarianism and how not just nonviolent movements are using social media to, to organize, but how governments are uh, using um, social media to spread disinformation and, and, and repress people that are organizing that space. I think one of the challenges in, in different spaces is seeing, you know, how social media as a tactic, uh, depending on what, what it is, um, how that might uh, increase or, or decrease the, the, you know, how, how successful that as a tactic can be. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, a lot of um, people who are experts who have been studying this a lot longer than I have, they'll, you know, share that, you, you need the mixture of offline and online tactics, but that because of the age we're in, and especially with the pandemic, um, movements are, are relying uh, in, in general a lot more on, on social media, and that might be one of the contributing factors to the decrease in effectiveness of, of nonviolent campaigns that we're starting to see over this past decade, but there hasn't been enough, enough research in that field yet. Great. Thanks, Tabitha. Any other questions or input from your own experience on this reflection of active nonviolence and racial justice? We have about 10 minutes to go. Maybe as people are thinking, um, Dave, I wonder, or Kelly, were you gonna ask something? I was just going to say um, the the, uh, the long silence is a sign that um, Mary Nabler and Sam Kennedy should be saying something. <laughs> or not? Oh, go! Yes, I, I will. I'll take your call out there, Kelly. Um, First of all, thank you everyone for your expertise, your experience and all the work that you do. This has been really good to listen to. I appreciate the resources that have been provided as well. Um, yeah, I think that this is obviously an exciting time right now. And as we get into a new semester here at the University of Dayton, I'm interested in how to um, 
engage the energy of students while also respecting all the constraints we have at this moment. It's obvious that it can happen because it's happening everywhere and people are, you know, being actively engaged in, in social change in so many ways. So I think that um, thinking outside the box and being creative, like Dave was saying from the get go, is so important. And um, I look forward to seeing what kind of things our students want to do both on campus and off campus in a variety of different um, areas of social change. So I don't know if anybody has any, you know, suggestions on getting started with that or um, those who have been, you know, in the folds of it in this new way of, of living during this time. Um, yeah, I'd welcome anything. I, uh, just one thing I, I would um, share, and I share this at the very, very beginning, is um, we have an online course uh, and a guide based on our uh, staff curriculum, um, and it's all free. So I'm, I'm definitely happy to share that as a resource uh, after this call um, and, and answer any questions. It's, it's in English, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, so. And the focus of the course, Tabitha? Just nonviolent action in general? Yeah, sorry. So it's it's on our synergizing nonviolent action and peace building curriculum. So it's looking at and doing deep dive into, well, deeper dive into nonviolent action in our civil resistance courses. We have three of those, but um, it's, it's more of a, this is what nonviolent action is, and these are some skills. This is what peace building is, and these are different methods and approaches and skills. And these are strategic planning steps that um, are used by practitioners in both fields um, to be able to help you better understand how you might be able to sequence and integrate nonviolent action peace building tactics to achieve their, your, your goals. Because the idea um, and kind of what we've seen um, with nonviolent action peace building in general is that they kind of evolve separately when it comes to training and, and actual practice. Um, not necessarily when it's, you know, when you're talking to people on the ground that sometimes they'll go back and forth in between, but like from the, the, the training itself, there, there isn't that space to come and think about it from a more strategic um, standpoint. So uh, that's what the, the course is, is framed around. That is great. I think um, strategy is where I definitely fall short. Um, I used to teach a course on campus on um, the spirituality of nonviolence using a lot of like Pake Bene resources and looking at that journey more internally and everything at, with the hopes of moving towards some more active um, strategy, but I would yeah, appreciate some strategic outlook and planning is important. Dave, you put something in the chat box. Do you want to say what that was? Sure. I just put in our online um, resource and I can also put in some um, articles um, that might be helpful for folks. That would be great. I, I've, I've been sitting here kind of thinking, well, uh, well, in, in the first place, I was really um, struck by the example of starting a class um, on nonviolence by asking people, so what is violence? Right. And, and I started imagining if we were to begin there, and I'm thinking about UD, right, to say, what is violent? Where is the violence? And to look at um, how it is, in fact, all around us and built into what we take as the, the status quo, right, the normal. This could be... Uh, um, you know, there's a sense in which uh, when we, when you construe nonviolent activism broadly enough, I mean, maybe that's the kind of truth telling that would be important nonviolent activism for us at this moment at UD, right? To just um, to analyze really seriously and to say loudly and clearly the ways that there already is violence built into what people don't generally meet as um, violent. 
but it's just a thought I was having it, you know, on the sort of on the cusp of a new semester and thinking about in what ways is education contributing to either either sustaining um, uh, a, a kind of implicitly violent, structurally violent situation or challenging it. Seems like an interesting question to think about how can the classes themselves be acts of nonviolent activism. And, uh, you know, that's a complex question, uh, but, but I think, you know, part of it is like acknowledging um, like the, you know, we're, we're living in a settler colonial society that whose first inputs were slavery and theft of land. And even if you were, you know, part, grew up or your ancestors were in the North or something like that, like if you were white in this society, you benefit from that. Like there's a direct correlation between someone being killed by the police or brutalized and you not having any experience but positive ones or kind of like benignly negative experiences with the police. Mm -hmm. So there's a direct correlation between um, the experience of, you know, decent lives and those that aren't. This is how our system is set up. Winners, they're winners and losers. Thank you, Dave. We've got a couple minutes left. Anybody else with maybe one more comment or question? Tabitha, I was thinking about your comment about defund the police and how that can be really polarizing, like when people just hear it, but then it also has the opportunity to actually have conversation. And I think about that with the term nonviolence too, of, of the, the people who are like, well, there's just violence, violence exists and nonviolence, except for maybe a few times in history is not gonna be as effective maybe as violent strategies. So I'm just trying to think, and I don't really have a question per se, but thinking through how to get the people who maybe like won't even like think or want to hear the words nonviolence because they just hear it's ineffective. Like how to get those people on board or how to start the conversations w with them. I don't know. That's not directed just at Tabitha, but if anyone has any insight. Yeah, I mean, I like, I'll, I'll just get us kicked off. I, we get that kind of feedback and, and pushback all of the time. And, and that it, it comes from different places, depending on the context that, that we're in. You know, in some places, people see nonviolence as just being weak and as um, not being, you know, uh, not caring enough or not being courageous or brave enough um, to, to really, you know, fight for, fight for what you're, you're trying to, to fight for. Um, and in other cases, they think that it's an ideal, you know, thing that, that uh, is being perpetuated by um, people who uh, come from, you know, the, the quote unquote, like global north, or, you know, it's, it's more of a um, people who have the luxury and who don't have to worry about, you know, incredibly violent repression um, uh, that, that are able to, to talk through this. And so there's, there's a really, um, uh, enormous amount of responsibility that, that we feel when we do these trainings in, in different places because, you know, who, who are we to, to say like, oh, you know, you, you should take up arms um, to defend your family uh, or to, you know, um, fight for, for what you believe in. What we can share is what we know from research and what we know from experiences and, and where, you know, people have done this in the past and what's worked and what hasn't. And we know from these studies, you know, that, that have happened that nonviolent action is twice as effective as violent action, even in the, the you know, most like maximalist, you know, and, and, and re, you know, repressive in environments. We know that if you uh, win a campaign using nonviolent action, you are less likely to return to civil war you are more likely to democratize because of the organizing structures and ideals and values and principles that successful nonviolent campaigns generally take on. And, and so through sharing this information and working with facilitators and activists on the local level to kind of contextualize it, 
we oftentimes will, they'll have different um, options and avenues for talking about why nonviolent action, why, why they feel nonviolent action is important and the way to go. Um, but uh, that message is so much more powerful when it's coming from someone who understands and, and lives the context than it would ever be coming from me or Maria or, you know, someone who is looking at it from, from the outside. So I think that that's always, always important. And it's always like, you know, trying to approach the answer from a place of humility and, and just try, trying to provide that information. Thanks, Tyler, for that. All right, we've kind of reached our, our time um, for this session. Um, I just want to wrap up with some thank yous to Tabitha and Dave for your wonderful spirits and your creative activity in our society and Kelly for providing the space to get this conversation moving um, as kind of a first a first moment of three moments um, here at Dayton. You know, I heard Kelly talk about telling the truth of our systems at the university and more broadly that Dave was encouraging us to and, um, you know, maybe thinking about what organizing is happening around us locally in our, in our communities and cities and trying to connect with them. Um, I encourage you to, to read the Antoinette Tough story. Uh, it's one of the links on the participant doc that I, I shared and it's a, it's a good story to I think uh, express how powerful nonviolence can be with a, a gunman who broke into her school and she was able to, to de-escalate that. And then finally, you know, one of the things that happens a lot at our uh, colleges is like bystander situations. So uh, bystander intervention might be a training that um, might be uh, useful or fruitful for the, the college experience or so something else to, to think about. Kelly, anything else you want to say to wrap us up? No, um, just to say thanks so much to, to, especially to the speakers, to the people who joined us. And um, the tentative plan is um, two weeks from today, there'll be another session, which is going to be introducing the Catholic tradition of nonviolence um, in particular. So since you signed up for this, I'll be sure to have you on the list to get an announcement about that as soon as that's organized. Um, but uh, yeah, spread the word in your networks. Um, this is a conversation I think that we need to get started. And there's something very powerful, even about a group of people just raising these questions together. So thanks for the first steps. Not exactly first steps. Not like there hasn't been anything going on before. But anyway, first steps this semester. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Peace be with you. Thank all of you guys. Thank you all. Thank you so much.